Good morning and welcome to Whitmix's webinar on Hanau's Quint with Walt Richardson. My name is Chelsea Phillips and I am the Digital Marketing Specialist for Whitmix and I will be facilitating today's webinar. Let's begin with a few housekeeping items. First, you should see a questions box on your right hand side in the panel. Please feel free to type any questions you have throughout the presentation and Walt will be answering them at the end of the webinar. If you are a CDT, this webinar is approved for one hour of CE credit towards your certification. You will receive an email with one to two days that will tell you how to obtain your credit. Lastly, this webinar is being recorded. Within 48 hours, it will be up on the Whitmix webinar in the website section. Oh, it'll be up on the website in the webinar section. This morning, I have the pleasure of introducing Walt Richardson. Walt is a dental technician who partners with dentists, specialists, and technicians to understand and utilize the diagnostic and treatment planning process to resolve simple and complex dental situations. Walt has written articles and lectured nationally and internationally, primarily focusing on mastering the diagnostic wax up and diagnostic process. Ben Franklin's quote, failure to plan is planning to fail is at the core of his passion for consulting and helping others to create successful patient results. Walt has been a CDT for 39 years and is a cred credentialed technician with the Dawson Academy. Walt also holds an associate faculty position with the Dawson Academy. Today, Walt will be presenting the importance of understanding Hanau's quint. That's all I've got. So Walt, if you're ready, let's talk about the quint. I'm ready. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, very good. So this is an introduction to Hanhouse Quint. Um, it's uh, it's based off a, a paper that um, uh, Rudolf Hanau presented to the ADA in Louisville uh, back many years ago, and the the fundamentals and the concepts of this are timeless. And so um, I utilize these, this bit of information and in everything I do. Um, and I'm, I, I feel compelled to kind of share it with you. And first of all, I wanna say I'm very honored to be allowed to do a webinar for Whitmix. Um, and I thank Ann Steinbach for that. And I'm very humbled because I know there are um, people who are listening who are very capable in and of themselves and very uh, excellent technicians and or dentists. And I, um, I'm humbled by that and I'm greatly appreciated, appreciative of that. All right. So the Quint was presented in the 67th annual session of the ADA in 1925. And I um, uh, I think it's kind of cool. I'm doing it for uh, Whitmix, who's in Louisville as well. So um, one of the things in this whole paper that he writes in the beginning, he says, after all, there's only one course which promises success. It leads via the desire to experience, learn, analyze, understand, and apply. If the cycle is repeated many times, we'll realize that still more is to be learned. In other words, I started the whole thing out because the more we practice what we do, the better we get and the more we will learn and the more we'll realize we don't know. So um, hopefully you all will learn something. It's my goal that you'll walk away and be able to practice this right away because basically I'm simplifying it to the point where you should be able to. Um, the paper that he presented was articulation, define, analyze, and formulated. So who was Rudolf Hanau? He, he was born in South Africa. Um, he was a German, his parents were German immigrants to South Africa, and then he was born. Um, and unfortunately, he died at an early age because he was a brilliant man. Uh, he left South Africa after he got out of high school and went to Leipzig and Leipzig uh, is an engineering school. The university there is basically engineering and he got his degree in mechanical engineering. And when he completed his degree in 1906, 
he had the opportunity to move to New York City. And so he got a job with an engineering consulting firm to um, consult with them. So he worked for a few years and then um, Frederick Lester um, uh, commissioned that consulting firm to, um, he had a project that he needed done. And his goal was to um, survey what he, they called dentures, which is actually uh, plaster models to survey arts forms to see if they couldn't come up with some standardization of arts forms because he wanted to create uh, standard arch wires that could be used in his orthodontic practice. He, he was a, a graduate of the Angles um, School of Orthodontics in New York. And they published their findings in 1916 in the Journal of Orthodontia, and this is the um, journal. This is uh, this is the article out of the journal, and I found the this a very interesting article. Um, he uh, discusses um, his findings and the some findings which were. Um, contrary to, um, say, Dr. Holly's findings on arch forms and so on. And, and so he he's conflicts with some of the people. But mostly out of this, I wanted to define who Hanau was. He was not a dentist. He never had anything to do with dentistry until um, he hooked up with Dr. Um, Lester. And he considers him a dental and himself a dental engineer and um, dealing with and solving the intricate problems of orthodontia. And he, he embraced that, that term throughout the rest of his life, actually he called himself a dental engineer. So after he finished doing his things with um, Lester, he moved to Buffalo, New York where um, where he did pass in Buffalo, but he met up with Rupert Hall. Rupert Hall was a prosthodontist who um, was very fascinated with articulation. And so he put the bug in Hanau's bonnet and um, Hanau came out with his first articulator, the Model A, and this is a drawing up in the upper right, is a drawing of his patent for that, um, which he got in 1921. But um, in 1918, he actually um, had gone past his patent and um, created a Model C, which was exhibited in shown at the, the um, Milwaukee meeting of the National Society of Dent Denture Processes. And that's what they were calling a lot of these, um, what we might know as denturist now, but they were, had gone to a dental education of some form. So the development of the articulator caused Hanau to evaluate and define articulation. And, you know, he creating the articulator was a huge step in and of itself, but the concepts he had to break down and figure out what it is that he was actually making. And that top line of this chart, which is the first chart in the um, paper presented, um, is occlusions plus relations, meaning relations of teeth, plus function of those of the whole masculatory system, the whole jaw equals articulation. So, and in there, in the paper, he presents um, occlusal schemes. He also presents um, jaw positions and he plots them in a graph uh, where they were. Um, and where the teeth are in relation to different spots of where the jaw is, um, the joints are. 
which I found fascinating because he had no x-rays. He had no um, um, real diagnostic equipment that we have today. But when you analyze it, it's spot on and you can compare it to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you can compare it to um, CT scans of today. So this chart breaks down all the um, various sections of articulation um, for us to visit here today. And I, what I did was I, I broke them all down. What I found interesting in this um, thing was um, under malarticulation, a lot of times he writes in the very bottom line in prosthesis, the sad rule, meaning a lot of times we're creating prosthesis there that have mal occlusions or mal uh, articulated. And he, he was troubled by that. He compared complete dentures later on and was troubled by the fact that these weren't done correctly. So, and then further down at the bottom of the page, um, he um, just even acknowledged the fact that there can be balanced malocclusions. And that, that's through uh, minimal amount of wear that the, the body naturally will create um, a balance in and of itself. That isn't good. Okay, the 10 types of articulation, those 10 types, the natural articulations, his definition was natural or prosthetic dentures conforming to physiological requirements. Now, mind you, dentures are models. The natural or prosthetic. Unnatural articulation is natural or prosthetic dentures not conforming to physiological requirements or due to limitations or abnormalities. Cleft palate could be one of them. There's all kinds of um, things like that. Anatomic articulation, the articulation of natural teeth. And that's, I put dentures because that's what he refers to models of. Uh, natural teeth, he calls them dentures. Prosthetic articulation is the articulation of prosthetic dentures. So they're all dentures, one's prosthetic, one's just dentures. Semi-prosthetic articulation, the articulation of natural dentures combined with prosthetic dentures. Ordinary articulation, complying with accepted laws of articulation, and that means they're always balanced in every way that the jaw moves or and or in centric occlusion, they, they're always balanced. Malarticulation does not comply with accepted laws. Lack of balance in part or whole. So you could have a, a steep um, anterior guidance, but when they actually occlude, they, uh, they're malarticulated. Mixed articulation is balanced to and from centric occlusion during part of mastication found in natural dentition. The balanced articulation, the change from one balanced occlusion to another during the mascatory process. Unbalanced articulation. The change from one occlusion to another, but balance is interrupted or lacking. I'm sure now your minds are all going and you're 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 sort of realizing, okay, he's meaning this, and over here he's meaning this, and, and you can see how they have to all integrate. So I wrote this unbalanced articulation induces a patient to perform malarticulation. And ultimately, the patient acquires an unnatural articulation, subconsciously looking for a path of least resistance and comfort in centric. And what is that? That is 
wear or worn in tissue. That's taking all the factors of articulation, those 10 factors, and breaking it all down. And this is, this is what we know today is wear or worn in tissue. So, Hanau identified five factors that govern articulation, and, and he, um, he started out with eight and then broke it all down to five, and um, these are the five that we deal with every day, and um, we, we figure out ways to work with them. So, one of them is consular guidance. That's... Incisal guidance, we all know what that is. The incisors and we, we um, move them in and out, open up anterior guidance and uh, shallow it out and do all kinds of things with it. The plane of occlusion, cuspites, and compensating curve. The compensating curve uh, is not only curve of speed, but it's the curve of Wilson. So let's identify them. Let's define them all and, and go um, so that we can utilize um, them in our thinking here. So conjular guidance is the forward. The black represents the um, glenoid fossa and the eminence. Um, the downward and forward and downward movement directed by the eminence. So as the condyle travels down like that, that's, that's conjular guidance. The inclination of which is expressed by the angle of the horizontal plane. So the horizontal plane is, every articulator has a horizontal plane area on it um, and um, the ground, I mean, we know we have to define that horizontal plane because everything is referenced to that horizontal plane. All movements of the condylar heads are accepted as starting in the socket, the glenoid fossa, and returning to it. That's a quote, direct quote, I should have put it in quotes, um, out of his paper. So right there, he's talking centric relation. And he, he says it, it, that's the beginning and that's the end. So um, he's written a whole other paper on centric relation and how that works. And it's, it's absolutely fascinating. But he, he's talking centric relation at this point. And, the, and, it, and it, in reality, you have to have a beginning and starting point because articulators are like that. Our articulators are always centric relation, whether we mount them with a centric relation bite or not, because they have, it's always up in the uppermost, superior modes of the articulator um, fossa. Conjular guidance, when do we use it? Why is it important? Why is it an anterior component? We use it for open anterior bites. In severe wear cases, so we've seen a lot of these cases where the maxillary lingual cusp are worn and the buccal cusp are somewhat virgin, but the, the wear on those lingual cusps at times can be all the way to the, to the free gingival margin. We've seen all kinds of cases like that. And um, um, a conjular, uh, a protrusive bite is absolutely necessary when you see that. And that's what I do is I always ask the dentist for a protrusive bite whenever I um, get models like that um, that are mounted and so on. And the last thing is the TMJ dis displacement, which can result in a flatter condylar path. Um, that's the other time we would want a protrusive bite so that we could measure and set our articulators to condylar, um, the proper condylar inclination. Incisal guidance includes protrusive, horizontal, lateral guidance, and the incisal edge itself as a guiding surface. So what he's saying there is that um, anytime the inter teeth 
the incisors and so on are engaged, no matter what surface it is, with the exception of the labial surface, obviously, is, or that could be in a class three, are guiding surfaces. The maxillary lingual surfaces of the incisors and cuspid provide guiding planes for the man mandibular incisors. All right, compensating curve. One of the friends of Hanau was Charles Munson. And Charles Munson is well known for his research on thousands of skulls and coming up with um, Munson's curve, what is termed as Munson's curve. And we typically measure that with a SOPA, um, simplified occlusal plane analyzer, or a Broderick flag, or what have you. But in, in, in short, where you see this um, translucent blue ball, what you notice is from a cephalometric viewpoint where the red dot is, that's the center point of Munson's curve, which is the glabella. That's the center point, the mafia's bullseye, uh, so you could call it that. But that ball will touch the, um, all the cusp tips and the incisors, the central incisors, and bisect the joint. That's how we determine what that curve really is. So you can see the facial, so you get to see the curve of Wilson down there is where the buccal cusp tips and the lingual cusp tips are gonna touch on that curve or that ball. And then, um, so you've got your curve of Wilson and your curve of speed is that, that cephalometric view of that skull where it's bisecting the, the condyle. The purpose of it is to allow for uninterrupted relationship between the maxillary and mandibular dynamic functions. So what that means is as the, the mandible is moving because of that curve, it, the mandible also works in an arch form and thus um, when teeth are in their proper position, you have no interferences or no bumping here or there. If you do, then that's why we're here to learn more. There's a direct relationship of the compensating curve and the buccal lingual inclination of the posterior teeth. This is a really important concept because the broader the jaw or the bigger that uh, Munson's curve is, the more upright those teeth will be. In other words, research shows that this, Munson's curve is probably one of the most researched um, concepts in the world. There's data coming out of India and Japan, um, Africa, um, there's been some other African-American studies that from in the United States about all this stuff, but let's use the, the Japanese discovered that the average Asian skull is a four and a half inch curve. All the ones that that ball starting from the gobella um, outward to the out, part of the ball is four and a half inches. That's the average. Um, Munson, he only analyzed Anglo-American skulls and he discovered that their average was four inch. That's where we came up with the four inch when we were learning at the Panky Institute or wherever we went to learn um, is that four inch curve. But worldwide, it varies. So that buccal lingual inclination of posterior teeth is an ethnic thing too. So that we know if we're working with an Asian patient and we're trying to restore them, those, those posterior teeth are going to be uh, on the mandible are going to be more upright. And that will change the angulation of the maxillary teeth as well. So the plane of occlusion as, as, um, Hanau defines it. It's a triangular plane from the incisal embrasures of the mandibular two central incisors 
to the buckle grooves of the lower second molars. So it's a flat plane that um, connects those three spots. And Bill Arnett, um, orthopedic surgeon out in California, states that the plane of occlusion must be three to seven degrees from the horizontal plane. I use that, um, I've added this in, this isn't part of the quint, I add this in because this, in my opinion, um, puts a lot of sense to everything. Hanau was all about doing everything on a flat plane. So his goal was to get that triangle flat, parallel with the horizontal plane. There are times in dentures um, where that is necessary, but the, the average patient is three to seven degrees inclination. <clears throat> All right, cusp tip. He identified cusp tip as um, one of the five uh, factors influencing articulation and um, it's from the base of the tooth to the cusp summit. That's a tricky, can't say that five times. Anyway, um, an average 20 degree tooth is two millimeters from the base to the cusp tip. So um, this gives you an idea. The base is where actually the, um, some, the primary grooves because of the development. That's, you go down to, you just see the primary grooves and that's it, that's their base. All right. This was an important thing to me because when I first learned about um, Hanau's quint, and I, it's, it's funny, I, about 15 years ago, I met um, a prosthodontist in a face course that I took. Um, and uh, Jeff McLennan, and he's since become a good buddy. I, he's, a, he's a brilliant man and I respect him immensely. He's Prasadana's up in New York City. And he said to me, if you really wanna know how to treatment plan, because that's, that's my passion, you need to understand Hannah's Quinn. Well, then I started asking around and everybody kept telling me, oh no, that's just for dentures. That's just for dentures. Even though dentures are, are uh, of great interest to me. Um, I love dentures. Um, I love learning about it. Jack Turbofil, I've been to his stuff. I've been to massage courses. I love dentures and they definitely have a place in, in, um, in restorative dentistry. And I wanted to learn how to do them well. But one of the things that fascinated me was when I started reading the quint, I mean, the, the articulation defined, this statement stood out to me. He said, the fundamental laws involved are practically alike for orthodontic, periodontic. Well, he says periodontic because there was no oral surgeons back then. They were periodontists. They were oral surgeons, but they were also periodontists. Crown, bridges, partial and full denture work, though the manipulations in their applications may differ, all right? This is a direct quote out of this paper, and um, that got me excited because that made it so that I could utilize this whenever and however I wanted to use it in order to help me do my job and do a better job to, you know, to help dentists, help patients, and so, that got me all excited. So, Hanau simplified those laws of articulation by the use of the articulation quint. So, by putting it all together in one thing, now mind you, this is only part of that paper, this whole quint thing, but this is, this is an important concept of his paper. Uh, it is a combination of the most essential laws and factors of the articulation. Each fifth represents a factor undergoing change. So when we look at this chart, each one represents something. So conjular guidance, compensating curve, relative cusp height, incisal guidance, and plane of occlusion. Those are the five factors that affect articulation 
um, which means occlusion, which means function, and so on. Each arrow represents a change to the factor indicated in the respective fifth. So by compensating curve, as the arrow goes out, you're increasing the prominence. So you're becoming more class two, a real steep curve of speed, or you're flattening it, you go on the other way. A reverse arrow is a request to reverse the change. So let's take relative cusp heights. So as the arrow goes outward, he, he says you're decreasing the cusp height, so you're flattening it. So D, which is in sizal guidance, if you flatten it, the main arrow is increasing the horizontal in inclination, but D is going in the reverse of that, so you're gonna decrease the horizontal inclination. So you can steepen that plane somewhat, okay? This doesn't mean you go all the way to one extreme to the other. It means somewheres in there, you're balancing all this stuff out. So Thielman, who came later, utilized um, the quint to discuss um, his theories of real variables. Um, an example of a real variable would be um, if you've ever been in the hospital and they ask you on a scale of one to 10, what is your pain? And some people may say six, some people may say four, everybody has different pain tolerances. So those variables could change, but you're assessing a numeric value to whatever you um, believe your pain is. So in this case, um, we may say, um, um, the conjular guidance is is very shallow, so its its variable is minus one or could be zero. You know, we're this it's arbitrary and it's up to any individual given individual. But this is when you sit down and you plug in numbers to your formula. The idea is to get C to be one, meaning balanced. One has to equal one or that C has to equal whatever those numbers total up, divide out, multiply and divide out to be, that C better be that number. All right, so what I chose to do is, I chose to do because everybody says, oh, that's just a denture thing. I chose to show you um, the concepts at work. And this is a patient that um, was, from a dentist that I, I, I do a lot of work with, consulting, just doing diagnostics for him. I don't do anything else for him. I set the cases up, I do the backs ups, and then he has um, an in-house lab guy that does his work. But I help him get the, the in-house lab to where he needs to be. So we look at this patient, he's got really long teeth, um, Typically, we see that in, in uh, people who have very steep overbites, you know, class twos, uh, div two. We see all these teeth are catawampus. Um, we see the plane of occlusion looks pretty jacked. And so we're thinking, when you first look at that, you say, oh, man, we're going to have to rebuild this whole guy's mouth and um, this guy's whole mouth. And... You know, you see the tori and, and your, your, your eyes are just drawn to this. So um, I chose this case because I thought it, it really represented well what we needed to do. So protrusive bite showed that his conjugate guidance was really shallow. His incisal guidance, he had none. He had posterior interferences. If you look at the posteriors, they're interfered. They're they're in the way. They're the molars, the first molars, um, 14s, rubbing up against uh, number 19 or 18, and you know so on. I mean, but he has no anterior guidance. You can see that's open. Uh, left or right, he has no cuspid rise. He has no cuspid contact or anything. So we have no incisal guidance. That's a problem. Our conjular guidance is a fix. 
So when we evaluate the plane of occlusion, what I did was I took my little triangle and I put it on, on that model, on his lower model, um, in, in between the, the centrals there, that embrasure, all the way back to the buckle groove of the second molar. And then I put a surface level on top of that. And I see that this bubble is almost perfectly centered and is at three degrees. So from three to seven degrees, I'm golden. I mean, I've got a great plane of occlusion. Now, when I go to evaluate the compensating curve aspect of it, on the outside, you'll see that I used a SOPA to, to show um, that you barely see any pencil marks from our, our compass. That's a four inch curve and you barely see any uh, pencil marks on, on those posterior teeth. The uh, curve speed doesn't seem to be so bad. Same way on the, on the patient's right side, which kind of shocks me. I'm, I'm kind of blown away when I first get this. But then as I evaluate the curve of Wilson, part of the compensating curve, I realize that the buccal cusp tips are too high and the lingual cusp tips are too low. This is a four inch curve. This is an inside of the four inch curve. But when I do the four inch curve for the curve of Wilson, it'd be, you know, this little thing that I made, which is like a segment of my ball, is it's touching both the lingual cusp tips and the buccal cusp tips. So I know my buccal lingual inclination of those, buc or those posterior teeth on the lowers are perfect. And that curve of Wilson is fine. Are the teeth kind of a little bit off? Yeah. But the plane of occlusion and the compensating curve on the curve of speed is fine. The lower compensating curve is fine. The upper compensating curve, curve of Wilson, is not fine. So no anterior guidance in our compensating curve is kind of wacky. So cusp heights. When I look at these cusps, they're pretty extreme. And I'm thinking that Something's got to give here. And because the teeth on the lower are a little bit catawampus and so on, I'm thinking I'm going to have to address those. I see that the compensating curves off, but if I'm to correct that, I'm going to have to take and kind of smooth out some of these cusps maybe on the lower. Got very steep cusps. And um, so here we go. Here's how I made my corrections. This is how I put the whole thing to work. Um, Conjular guidance was a given. I, I, I'm, I was pretty impressed how shallow this guy was because I could see why the heavy cuss tips and the, the teeth being kind of um, catawampus could cause a, you knew there were interferences just by knowing that and then seeing the, what the models looked like. So, incisal guidance. He now has incisal guidance. I got cuspid rise, I lengthened the cuspids and so on. And the centrals, I use the red, I gotta tell you that I, get, I use the red wax because this guy went to Ohio State and he's a big Buckeyes fan and, and he loves his red. So all the wax ups I do for him are in red wax. That's the way he presents it in white models. So, I gave you, um, gave this guy um, anterior guidance, you know, on lateral and end on function and so on, and disclusion. But part of the way I got disclusion was I had to eliminate all the interferences for when they went forward um, into protrusive. And so what I did was, I flattened the buccal cusp tips from the curve of speed on the upper. I, um, so that they, you can see they're almost straight across. I eliminated all the possible um, interferences from those buccal cusp tips that were touching before. 
So my lower plane of occlusion was fine, but I had three little areas. Um, number 26 was a little higher than all the rest, so I flattened them out so that I could have a balanced end-on function. Um, the incisal edge is rubbing across each other. And I had two little areas in that posterior, those cuss tips, <clears throat> and that one triangular ridge because of the angulation of number 29. Um, I relieved a little bit of that. So now when I go and I check the compensating curve, I kind of flattened the curve of speed, as you can see. And curve of Wilson, I was able to um, correct by making the buccal cuss tips and the lingual cuss tips touch that four inch arc. Um, and so I've corrected the um, compensate the curve of Wilson and the curve of speed, I've flattened it uh, on the upper. Now, if you can kind of peek through the to the central, through my little plastic plate, all the way to the centrals and incisors, you can see I didn't add any height to those centrals. I automatically got um, um, guidance by correcting the cusp height. You can see here, I didn't. I actually took away some on number eight. So my cusp height, I made shallower on the upper. I kept a steeper cusp heights on the lower. So anytime we do that in dentures, we, we either lingualize occlusion by making the lingual cusp tips come down and touch the lowers, or we buccalize the occlusion by making the lower buccal cusp tips touch marginal ridges or central grooves of the upper teeth. And so this is what I ended up doing. I ended up buccalizing the occlusion and um, getting good centric stops down the long axis of those teeth and um, not getting cuss tips in the way. So this is how I've kind of, I kind of visualize the quint so that it's, it makes more sense to me because when I first look at this uh, quint, I felt compelled that I had to go to one extreme or the other with the arrows. I had to go from one, you know, all the way out by increasing the, the inclination of the incisors, or I had to decrease them all the way. I, I, I felt compelled that way. But once I tied in Thielman and his real numbers and realizing to get balanced occlusion, all I needed to do was assess little values to them, I could make that work. So the only thing I could think of was a soundboard. I love music. And so a lot of times I've been places and you see the guys working the soundboard and that's always fascinated me. I couldn't do it if I wanted to, but this is what I envisioned. So I visualize the diagram of the quint as a soundboard. The center of the quint is like you're in the center of the room and you're trying to balance all the sound around you. Um, those switches on the board balance that out. They balance the sound. So the arrows on the quint are moved to achieve natural, ordinary, balanced occlusion. That's, that was his whole drive was to balance this out. But I use the soundboard concept on that quint. So our patient, so these letter values on the soundboard are the same as these letter values here. So conjular guidance is A. So A um, is in the middle there, and you just saw that move. It's fixed. So it's, it's at zero, it's in balance, okay? The incisal guidance was increased or steepened automatically by relieving the posterior interferences. So we were able to, and that was a problem, we had none. So D is the incisal guidance. And I said, yeah, that was a real problem. And so I assessed it a value of a three. And so I was able to get incisal guidance. Plane of occlusion was adequate. I mean, it was with the exception of those three little areas that I removed, um, I um, um, was able to work with that whole plane of occlusion. And the compensating curve was increased on the maxillary. In other words, I increased 
the curve of Wilson. I increased the cusp tips to all touch um, that four inch curve. So I increased it. So I moved it up. And the cusp height was decreased on the maxillary. And so I brought them down to balance out the occlusion. Now I know for a fact that that case, and I wish I had post-ops, but that case turned out very well, totally balanced, and the, the points of occlusion and the dynamic functions, there was no interferences and so on, just by doing the upper. And we didn't have to do the whole mouth, which, which was nice. And so we're, it's this system by evaluating things based on the quint allows us to truly evaluate, do we really need to do that much work on this patient? You know, I mean, um, Pete Dawson always said, uh, less is better. So I, I, I kind of, I kind of like using this quint in order to, um, create that balanced um, stable occlusion. So we see patients or models in a snapshot in time. Our end goal is to create balance and harmony and understanding these five factors and how they apply and how to apply those laws governing that articulation will allow for success in all disciplines of dentistry. I firmly believe this. I firmly believe that this is the core of whatever we do in order to do the best job we can. Even when I do single units on the articulators, I, I have all this in mind. I pay attention to cusp heights, I pay attention to any possible interferences and so on. And, and I think these are the fundamentals and I, um, um, these help you achieve any balanced occlusion in any, any way. There is, um, there is no better way in my, that I have found to achieve the balanced occlusion than by understanding these concepts. This is my wife um, and myself. Uh, we were in Louisville and that picture was in Louisville. Um, and um, I first presented this concepts to some people at a study club in Louisville at the Whitmix facility. And that's when I was asked by Ann and others to to put this together and i'm once again i'm very um honored and i'm very humbled by the fact that y'all came and wanted to listen to this and hopefully i've i've given you something to think about and to learn and i want to say thank you that's my email if you want to email me any questions or whatever i'm open to that i will try to answer everything um and Thank you very much. Awesome. Well, thank you, Walt. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, it looks like we have a couple questions here for you, if you're ready. Yes. Okay. Awesome. It's a two-parter. Says, mm -hmm. you mentioned compensating curve is curve of Wilson. According to the prostodontic terms, the anterior posterior posterior curving in the median plane and the medial lateral curving in the frontal plane within the alignment of the occluding surfaces and incisal edges of artificial teeth that is used to develop balanced occlusion. Mm -hmm. um, nuance correction, but then the next part says glossary of prosthodontic terms, eighth edition. Compensating curve one, the anterior posterior curving in the median plane and the medial lateral curving in the frontal plane within the alignment of the occluding surfaces and the incisal edges of artificial teeth that is used to develop balanced occlusion. Two, the arc introduced in the construction of complete removable dental prosthesis to compensate for the opening influences produced by congular and incisal guidances during lateral and protrusive mandibular excursive movements. Mm -hmm. it's a um, I'm guessing it's a clarification question. Uh, that's exactly the curve of Munson. That's, that's a great description of the curve of Munson. It's exactly what I described to you. So that, that curve or that, that translucent ball that you saw on that picture 
um, I can bring that up actually. Um, that uh, is a just that is a drawing. of exactly that definition. So the incisors to the posterior section curved all the way up in that arc is exactly how we create balanced occlusion. And that, that, that definition is spot on with what Munson's curve is. But it, said, um, it says you mentioned compensating curve is curve of Wilson. Should it be curve of Monson instead? No, I said right here, refers to curve of speed and curve of Wilson. It's okay. both. It, the curve of Munson is both. That's why when, when I went through and I evaluated them here, um, uh, let me see if this is it. When I evaluated curve of speed, now let's go back to when I was troubleshooting. Right here. When I was evaluating this um, case here, I evaluated the curve of speed. And in the middle, these middle two are the curve of Wilson. So I have a curve of Wilson in the middle and the curve of speed on the outside. So compensating curve is both. And the curve of Monson is the term for both the curve of Wilson and the curve of speed. Compensating curve re refers to both items. Perfect. I hope that answers that question because that's a, it's a very good question because um, I didn't want to confuse anybody in thinking that it was only one or the other. It's both. So, and I have ways to evaluate both. The curve of speed is on the outside and the curve of Wilson's in the inside. Fantastic. Well, that looks like all of the questions. Um, I'll give it a couple more minutes just in case a couple come through, but I do want to remind everybody that this was recorded and will be available on the Whitmix website in 48 hours. And if you are needing CDT credit, we will be emailing you within one to two business days on how to receive that. Doesn't look like we have any other questions. So thank you for your time, Walt. It was absolutely wonderful. And we look forward to doing future webinars with you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I appreciate everyone who, who uh, took their time out to, to attend, for sure. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a good one.